Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or I guess evening, depending on which part of the uh, globe you're dialing in from today. Uh, my real pleasure to add to Paul's welcome. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar entitled Innovation and Disruption in the, fin uh, the Finance Landscape. Uh, we're really grateful that you've taken the time to spend with us today and hopefully you'll get some uh, real value add for your own particular business in this session. As I did, I've intimated, uh, I'm here in the UK or Paul's intimated, I'm here in the UK. Javier is uh, dialing in from France and Paul's in the US. So hopefully again to give you a real global insight on the fintech market. I wanted to start with what hopefully is quite a thought provoking quote from Anderson Horowitz, which states that the battle between every startup and incumbent comes down to whether the startup gets disruption before the incumbent gets innovation. So if we start to think about that statement in the context that I believe every industry eventually gets disrupted with the focus and pace within financial services. Nowhere is that battle going to be more hard fought than in the fintech arena. So as a result of the scale of change thus far, which again, I'd profess is only going to accelerate, the opportunities to grow real scale for fintech businesses are huge. And similarly, for incumbents to transform their business models, similarly massive opportunities. However, I think there is a flip side to that in that with the competition intensifying, the likelihood of failure still looms large at both ends of the spectrum. So as a result of that backdrop and landscape, what uh, Javier and I aim to cover over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes or so, we'll take a look at the current state of the market, what the hot spots are, uh, what we believe is, is coming up next and some of the exciting trends. Take a look at how the existing financial services companies are looking to innovate and the various models that they're looking at, either adapting to work with fintechs or protecting, protecting their own business models against the emergence of fintech. And then we'll take a look at some of the business models that are winning in today's markets to take some practical uh, looks and steps in terms of who's, who's winning. Armed with all that information, I guess the key objective of today's session is to enable you to start thinking about your own businesses in the context of the marketplace and to help you maximize the opportunities and really work towards refining or developing a strategic action plan, clearly dependent on where you are in terms of the growth journey. I'd suggest this is appropriate whether you're a fintech business looking to generate traction, increase, increase scale in the growth stage, or even as an institution looking to embed fintech in your organization. Uh, Paul's touched on the hygiene issues for the call. You'll be on mute only during the call, but please feel free to use the chat facility uh, within the GoToMeet technology to where any questions or observations. Hopefully, as I say, we'll get the opportunity to respond to those live on today's call. But if not, we'll follow up uh, immediately after the call with email responses. So in terms of host today, I'm Damien, Damien McGann. Uh, I've got a background working for multinational banks, specialising in the area of business growth. More recently, I've been working with some of the most creative businesses in the fintech sector. So hopefully I've got a really good handle on seeing the sector from both sides of the equation and I'll share some experience with you today. I'm really delighted to be joined by Javier, Javier Guavier Torres. And Javier has got a wide experience uh, launching innovative financial products and services for globing legal banks. Uh, he's a man who can really say he's got a truly international background. He's worked across four different continents and currently researching emerging technology trends in fintech. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to Javier and, and some of his deep insights. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Javier, who's going to set the scene with the current state of the market and look at current and emerging trends. Thank you very much, uh, Damien. Uh, nice introduction. And uh, hello to everyone who is joining us today. Uh, so let's set the scene of what the current state of the global fintech market is starting by the investment trends that we saw during 2018. Global investment in fintech got momentum in 2018. It was an exceptional year. Uh, it was driven in part by a massive investment deal 
the 14 billion BC funding round raised by N Financial, reaching a total funding of 39.2 billion and across 1,700 deals, doubling the 2017 figures. Investment in Q3 already exceeded the amount uh, of fintech funding seen in 2017. It's interesting also to highlight here that investors during 2018 focus on more mature startups as early stage deals drop to five quarter low in Q3. In terms of regions, uh, it dip in nearly every region in Q3 as Q2 saw a series of concentrated deals. It included Datamir, New Bank, Trade Chief, and Revolut, among others. So if we exclude AIM Financial 14 billion round, Q2 2018 was still a record high, and Asia saw the largest funding dip in Q3. Also, the fintech market continues to broaden and diversify. We're seeing more activity and bigger deals in less traditional markets, uh, such as Brazil, Japan, and South Korea. However, investors still keep pouring records funds into mega rounds, those uh, over 100 million, into the US and Asia over Europe. Uh, in terms of uh, new unicorns, 2018 set a new record. We had 16 new entrants, including Revolut, Play, New Bank, Trade Chief, Policy Bazaar, and Tiger Brokers, among others, which are now valued at 144.9 billion. The new 1 billion plus valuated companies are disrupting across capital markets, blockchain, SMAE, and personal finance. South Korea and Brazil got their first fintech unicorn in 2018. Okay, so now we will move into the sector trends to understand where investors are, having, uh, are placing their bets in fintech. I, I have highlighted here four of, four, four of the most relevant areas. During 2018, in the more mature fintech areas of payments and lending, dominant market players continue to emerge, attracting larger and larger deal sizes, 3.6 billion for payments and 3 billion for alternative lending as Q3. SMAE was a hot area during 2018, as fintechs were looking to solve critical needs from SMAE beyond loans and financing. For example, new unicorn as Toast, an all-in-one point of sale and restaurant management platform, including CRM, saw a 249 million investment during 2018. Also, 250 million went to Trade Shift, a procured to pay supply chain management platform for SMEs, which included as key investors uh, Santander and HSBC. On the other side, the digital uh, challenger bank model saw a strong rise in investment globally. In the case of Revolut, N26, Atom Bank, etc. Also new entrants in this space were also targeting niche customer pain points. For example, Brex that extends credit to starts out raise 125 million, leveraging an in-house KYC and underwriting process. Brex issues credit card based on the amount of money the starts out corporate bank account, automate expenses, and integrate receipts into their accounting systems. Okay, so let's now move into the trends. 
what we saw during 2018 and that we can expect keep influencing investment during 2019. The first one is we're seeing that the startups are becoming more aggressive and ambitious. They are developing new and expanding their existing capabilities to complement their propositions, inclusive adding innovative features ahead of banks. For example, Revolut and Robinhood tapped into the cryptocurrency investment and since then they have reached important customer growth adding 1 million customers each in just a few months from launching. On the automated financial advisor, Wealthfront also moved from investment into lending and real estate to diversify and evolve its offering. They are also developing their proposition through collaboration with other startups, leveraging their technology and adding new investment channels. Fintechs are collaborating with the strategic players. For example, N26 is partnering with Raisin, which with just a few taps, allow customers to open a, bank, a saving account for their extra money with the best rate across Europe. Users of N26 who are self-employed, freelancer, students can also request a loan thanks to Oxmoney, which is a peer-to-peer -peer platform. N26 customers are also able to join the WeWork network and get credits to the deserved workplace and conference rooms. N26 strategy is fitting with the lifestyle of their customers, as N26 CEO Valentin Stalf noted recently in a conference press. Startups are also focused on delivering services more efficiently and holistically via leveraging their technology. In the case of TransferWise, that started as a current exchange platform and now has moved into banking offering customers to receive funds in 40 different currencies from the UK, the US, Australia, and the Eurozone, with no need to run into currency exchange fees and a, fee, a free debit card to spend in any currency around the world. In terms of new investment channels, we have mentioned on already Revolut and Robinhood that added cryptocurrency investment to their offerings. Revolut, in addition, announced plans to add commission-free stock trading and also Cash App, the number one app in the finance category of the App Store, as October 2018, added the ability to send Bitcoin to friends. Another trend is that the digital model is expanding very quickly. Challenger banks as N26, Revolut and Monzo raise money to expand internationally, looking especially to grow across Europe and reaching the US and Asian market. Revolut, for, for example, funded in 2015, it's set to hit the US market this year. And it says 75,000 people are already on the waiting list setting also an ambitious target of 100 million customers in the next five years. Revolut raised 250 million in 2018 and has reportedly lured a potential 500 million investment from Japan's SoftBank to fuel their desired growth. Another example is N26 who raised early this year, 300 million from new investors. The money will be used to finance a push into the US that will put N26 into competition with the biggest US retail banks, such as JP Morgan and Bank of America, both of which have launched their own mobile only banking offerings to compete with digital startups. N26, which does not have a banking a license in the US, will partner with a yet unnamed US bank for the first half of 2019. 
the company is predicting to acquire a million customers in the US within 12 to 24 months and expects also to surpass their 5 million customer target in Europe sooner than the end of 2020, the previously stated deadline. Also, consumer tech adoption is reaching a tipping point. With an average adoption rate of 33% across 20 countries, fast-growing economies with large populations as China and India make a unique playground. They have the highest adoption rates, take literate and financially underserved population. Mature markets as the UK and Australia realize the largest increase in the number of consumers adopting fintech from 2015 to 2017. And on the basis of anticipated future use, fintech, according to EY, adoption could increase to an average of 52% globally, with the highest intended use among consumers in three key countries, South Africa, Mexico, and Singapore. And so the digital banks has already 15 million users. Late, but new bank, which growth has come with significant investment in marketing. Since launching in 2014, 60% of new accounts application have come from customer referrals in app. One of the reasons of their viral growth is attributed to their exceptional customer service which has attracted social media and press attention. Customer service analysts have completely autonomy to surprise clients with a personalized experience at any given point. In one case, a single customer shared their experience with new bank on social media and reached more than 1.5 million people, said David Vélez, founder and CEO of new bank. So in general, we can see that fintech is growing on a global scale and the record level of funding seen in 2018, together with the diversification of investment across countries and products, will likely keep the fintech market strong for the foreseeable future. So now I hand over to Damien so we can take a look to where our competitors and leading financial companies are and how they are reacting to the surge of fintech. Okay, thanks Javier. Um, great session there and some really staggering numbers. Uh, so let's take a look at what the strategy of the leading financial service companies is to deal with these levels of disruption and then link that into who's actually winning in this race. If we just take a couple of minutes to look at the incumbents where they are and, and bring a few examples to life, I think slide 19 is an excellent example of what we call legacy technology and the impact on banks. Uh, in this particular slide, we're looking at traditional banks, capital markets, fixed income business, but I probably could have picked quite a few product sets, if not all of them, to give you a similar, uh, a similar description. And on the sample slide, the technology has got an average 38 years legacy behind it, 38 years old. So it's no real great surprise that traditional income streams are being attacked by new players. I think in addition to the income challenge legacy is giving banks, it's also a major challenge for the banks to ensure that they can handle the increasingly big data sets and all the additional compliance that the market rightly demands. Uh, which I can tell you certainly drives internal debates around budget allocation and prioritization, which is really important in terms of understanding your potential customers. That said, uh, it would be wrong if we didn't think that creating and implementing a culture of innovation isn't most likely at the top of pretty much every banking organization's corporate agendas. There's certainly no denying that a firm's own employees are very well positioned to understand both the customers their organization and the market. And certainly the larger players have got large scale franchises and customer bases, which are absolutely the envy of many. 
However, I think it's fair to say that whilst we've seen movement over the past decade towards a greater commitment to innovation, the very clunky organisational nature of most banks, coupled with a risk adverse culture, would indicate that it's not happening fast enough. Most research indicates that many corporates have got a surplus of ideas that are not being nurtured, certainly not quick enough. Uh, worse yet, the risk averse approach to innovation is creating, in many cases, incremental improvements rather than the wholesale level of innovation that the banks need to create a, uh, a meaningful ROI. I think finally, the structure of banking makes the entire process too slow, resulting in lost revenues. So our research over the years has found that whilst an innovative culture is very important to the generation of entrepreneurial ideas, and certainly in the investment innovation has increased year on year, many firms still don't know, view themselves as strong innovators, and there's a real lack of disruptive innovations that ever reach the customer. And I suppose the obvious outcome of this approach, especially with the onset of fintech and the once traditional, non-traditional players, I should say, like Amazon moving into financial services, uh, is that banks are, are losing relevance to customers and, and certainly many need to reinvent themselves. I think most organisations certainly now recognise that the uh, what they call the train of digital transformation is going uh, full, full speed ahead. And there's certainly no sign of it slowing down. And as Javier would indicate from the stats, if anything, it will be speeding up. Uh, but also, most also recognise that if they can't be the first to market with innovation in certain areas, it's critical, the fast followers. So I think the banks are certainly in the follower uh, part of the category. I'm not sure about the fast part, because as I've said, banking institutions have no choice but to speed up the process. They've got to be prepared to move more quickly when new opportunities arise and innovate, but also look at the emerging trends and integrate these into their future business models. Uh, an example, I was looking at some stats recently of the, um, the rise in voice operated services, such as the skills that drive Amazon Alexa. I'm sure many of you got uh, one of those at home these days. This technology are already achieving significant customer acceptance few banks have got solutions to use this technology. I think in addition to some of the, um, the more interesting technology, as I call it, it's also interesting to look at some of the basic hygiene points for organization today. I talk about doing the simple stuff very well, and if we take digital account opening, I would argue that in many banks, that's a major weakness for, lot, for lots of the banks, certainly from a consumer perspective. Uh, Brett King in the US says that 95% of US banks can't enroll a customer digitally yet every fintech does that to me it should be table stakes he says it shouldn't be that hard and i find it very very hard to disagree when you know the technology is out there many companies can do this stuff it's just the banks find it difficult to integrate it into the legacy uh, in terms of other mega trends i don't think it's any great surprise to anybody on the call that mobile banking is clearly the public's preferred method for dealing with the finances and the trends are that this is rising significantly. Just to put that into some numbers, around 2.1 billion banking interactions made in mobile in 2016, compared to 278 million branch visits, according to data by CICA. Um, and this is predicted to rise to 3.5 billion in 2021, while branch visits will fall significantly to less than 200 million. So that chasm and that trend is continuing and banks really need to address that. So looking at this slide, banks do realise that internal development may not be enough to deliver the speed and customer centricity they're aiming for, which absolutely prevents, presents great partnership opportunities for fintechs out there. Also, the pace is changing as banks recognises, banks recognise now that this is absolutely an imperative to the future business models rather than nice to have. And I think slide 24 demonstrates this fact with the pace. So in 2018, the top 11 US banks by assets participated in 49 equity rounds to fintech startups. If you look at that in comparison to 19 in 27, you can see that they're taking this very, very seriously and putting the money where the mouth is. Today, US banks are involved in more fintech rounds for two main reasons. Clearly, the high upside returns and also strategic partnerships. In some cases, a bank or CVC, corporate venture capital group, 
will invest in a startup strictly for the purpose of future returns. In others, as this slide will show you, banks will invest strategically. It invests and partners with a fintech startup to further its internal strategic goals. If you look at JP Morgan there on the slide, JP Morgan invested in restaurant payment startup LevelUp and then very cleverly integrated LevelUp's order ahead software into Chase Pay. Strategic investing is absolutely a growing trend among, among banks in 2018, as many banks have now solidified their internal digital strategies and they're looking at how they can execute at pace. As you'll see from the slides, it's an increasing trend and the major players are aligning themselves with multiple fintechs who, put simply, can address problems more efficiently and with a greater level of customer experience than the banks can by simply bolting on to their legacy systems and processes, as, let's be honest, the banks have done historically. If you look at Santander there in the bottom right hand corner, interesting example as they've partnered with several companies addressing pain points around payment, speed of decisioning, lending decisions, and payroll type services, which one could argue, I guess, are necessities in the follower category, but also Santander are getting much more creative and sophisticated by having a very specific and active investment arm in Santander Innoventures, but also being more adventurous in terms of the product sets and they were the first bank to use blockchain enabled technology, giving SMEs and consumers a better international payments experience. So as we've seen, the scale of investment into the sector is real strong testimony to the facts and the focus, interest and intensity increasing, there's no sign of this abating. However, I think it's worth just taking uh, a couple of points within the headlines here. Because in the main, investors and banks, as a result of the investor uh, privatisation, look at tech that meets immediate goals over disruptive technologies. Banks are also shifting from investing and partnering with external fintech startups to building their own fintech in-house. As such, I'd argue that for the fintech community, it's essential to have a strong handle on the ever-moving marketplace and a firm understanding of the bank's priorities on also understanding where they are struggling to innovate. This awareness should be a cornerstone of a fintech business strategy, either aligning with the banks to help address our priorities or exploiting their weaknesses to challenge them in the traditional income stream areas. So you need to think about within your own business model how well that chimes with the trends and how you're approaching growing your franchise. In simple terms, in respect of the first point on immediate goals rather than disruptive technologies, and I guess to an extent all points, it's a fundamental necessity that as a fintech business, you have a clear view on what the problem you're solving is and for who. One of my favorite definitions of innovation is actually solving a problem someone cares enough about to pay for it, which I think is very relevant in fintech. But that absolutely gets complicated, I recognize that, while your potential customers a huge international corporates and despite these guys attempting to create more agile and responsive business models they still struggle in the main to deploy new technology quickly and efficiently however i would suggest that you need to do your best to understand how the specific corporate you are targeting operates what structures they operate within what the governance processes are budget processes as all this will help you within the sales process and we'll cover that in more detail in the next module. Javier touched on regulation. I think it's very clear that heightening regulation has been a key driver and reg tech continues to be a growth area where opportunities lie. For me, if I look at the challenge there and also potential dichotomy for incumbents, it's really important that they improve in all areas of regulation, be it onboarding, cyber, financial crime, many others you could name. But at the same time, they need to improve and reduce the cost of delivering an improved customer experience, which is not a straightforward challenge. In this slide here, which is quite a busy slide, but it's an important one, you can see how we elaborate on this point and there's various models at play. Also, the crossovers from users and investors, which is becoming a common theme with the in-house investment teams applying effectively the same principle of investment to client priorities. 
If we expand on that theme and look at an element of focus of a couple of individual players, uh, we see how Goldman Sachs invests in consumer-facing tech, scaling its Marcus Digital Bank. These investments have spanned various categories across lending, payments, real estate. So Goldman's investments have been largely focused on alternative lending. In 2017, Goldman took a corporate majority in finance it and has since added home remodeling loans to its Marcus platform. Additionally, Goldman has invested in consumer mortgage startups, better mortgage and mortgage financial so solutions, which could well foreshadow a, more, a Marcus mortgage product in the future. Goldman is also investing in fintech startups that help consumers find and repay bet, debt. They've invested in Trussell, a free online mortgage broker, and even Financial, an API that connects consumers to personalized products. These investments may soon be integrated into Goldman's recent acquisition of Clarity Money, a personal financial management app. There's an increasing debate, if you think about this, as to whether banks need to effectively bite the bullet in certain areas and risk the short term danger of cannibalizing income streams to secure and generate longer term returns. Just this week in the UK, the COO of Oak North was talking about this very point. And if you think about what's happening in Europe with the onset of PSD2 and open banking, that's certainly an area I think that the banks should be worth considering difficult I recognize as it may be as an incumbent. So moving on to the next slide, other trends of note, the bank are beginning to invest in process automation, looking at automation software for both internal and external processes. Goldman Sachs and PNC recently invested in robotic process automation, um, RPA software, in the Automation Anywhere and WorkFusion businesses. RPA is the automation of effectively repetitive workplace tasks like document review, data entry and customer service. And it's part of the continual trend towards white collar automation. But clearly the goal here is, is that dichotomy of improving customer service at the same time. Additionally, if you look at what City, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, they've all invested in startups that help help small businesses automate back office processes. So some of these startups and, and there's numerous, but I could name uh, Bill.com, Scale Factor, Build Trust, Canopy Tax, they're all helping businesses simplify the role of the CFO by automating some of the mundane tasks like account receivables, accounting, uh, taxes and payments. Real estate, uh, real estate tech is also an emerging category. It's helping simplify consumer real estate operations and in 2018 again Goldman City and JPM all invested in real estate startups. In June City invested in Unison, a startup that allows homeowners to leverage their home equity for cash and home equity again is a really interesting growing market and one that can help banks strengthen the consumer real estate offerings. So lots to think about in there and I am conscious that there's a lot in the slides hence we will be um, passing those out at the end of the session. But before I wrap up the session, I thought it would be a really good way to finish if Javier was to look at a couple of very different but hugely successful business models uh, to see if there's some learns in there from the experiences that can help you in your own businesses. So Javier, over to you to talk Revolut and Amazon. Thank you, Damien. Uh, yes, as, as you said, we will take a look to two companies that have become stronger during 2018 and that are delivering a differentiated banking model. So we will tap into Revolut and Amazon. Revolut, uh, the UK digital bank, was launched in 2015 and ha achieved 1 million customers after two years of operation without a banking license. To put some context, it took First Direct, the telephone and internet-based retail bank of HSBC, 25 years to get the same number of customers. An important part of their acceleration is the addition of innovative products as the cryptocurrency exchange, the most viral Product Revolut has launched to date. Following the announcement in November 2017, 
the company crossed 1 million users and was adding 3,500 per day. A year later, Revolut reported it has 3 million customers, more than twice the number of customers that First Direct has today. It is the first challenger bank to announce break-even on a monthly basis. This means that the company is monetizing enough customers to offset the cost of acquiring new ones. But what Revolut have done differently to other digital banks? What has been their approach? We will see that in the next slide. In the case of other digital banks, as Atom, Tandem, Starling, N26, they all obtain a full bank charter, which takes up to two years to get, but widens the services banks can offer to consumers. The challenger has bet that a charter will, trust, will build trust with consumers and allow them greater flexibility in building the offerings. Tandem, Starling, and Atom, for example, all waited to launch products until receiving regulatory approval. To date, they collectively have only 520,000 customers. Revolut's strategy, on the other hand, challenged the conventional go-to-market strategy in four key areas. The first one is a plan for an easier to acquire e-money license, which can be obtained much more quickly. But the scope of services that can be offered is limited. But this has allowed them to focus resources on rapidly launching products and bringing customers on board uh, quickly. Only last month, Revolut got a European banking license, which means they are now authorized to accept deposits and offer consumer credits. Second, given the limited service that they were able to offer, they focus on targeting currency exchange customers rather than current accounts. Revolut initially focused on frequent travelers, a niche they believe was underserved. It built a digital currency exchange app which allow people to exchange money more frequently across countries without establishing multiple bank accounts. The third area is that Revolut leveraged the European Economic Area Passport to expand across Europe and partnered with other fintech to iterate quickly. It was able to launch products such as real estate, investing, lines of credit and well management without waiting for a charter, while quickly gaining access to a roster of potential clients for an eventual broader banking offering. The last one, the fourth one, and as previous mentioned, the most viral and innovative product Revolut has launched is the cryptocurrency exchange, which allows instantly exchange any of their 24 currencies directly into five different cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Revolut is today valued at 1.7 billion and has plans to grow even bigger. Just three years old, it's expanding to the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Japan in 2019. Revolut Ambitions is to be one of the largest financial services companies in the world, and so it aims to add 100 million customers in the next five years and sees cryptocurrency as an enduring part of the company's future. We can move now to our second winner business model, Amazon. While the rumors that Amazon will take into banking seems to get louder each year, it's important to first understand Amazon's existing strategy in financial services and how it aligns with Amazon goals. Amazon has already established key financial services from payments to lending to insurance to debit cards. Amazon is attacking financial services from every angle without applying to be a conventional bank. It's clear that the company remains very focused on building financial services 
products that supports its core strategic goal, which is increasing Amazon participation in the Amazon ecosystem, which you can see in the right hand side of the slide, the company has built and launched tools that aim to enable merchants, basically increase the number of merchants on Amazon and enable each one to sell more. Second, increase the number of customers on Amazon and enable each customer to spend more. And the third one, continue to reduce any buying selling friction in the marketplace. Amazon has around 310 million active customers in 170 countries, a strong infrastructure and data protection. Amazon Web Services, for example, is used by a big number of fintechs to deliver improvements in customer experience. Also, in parallel, Amazon has made several fintech investments, mostly focused on international markets developing economies as India and Mexico, where partners can help serve Amazon's core strategic goal. For example, invested in Greenlight Financial Technology, Greenlight provides a financial platform that helps parents teach their children about managing money. The firm offers a mobile app and a smart debit card with parental controls using the Greenlight platform parents can limit which store their children may spend money in. So Amazon has built an excellent position for expanding to financial services. Amazon banking could see four areas of differentiation, such as seamless onboarding process. It can a strong infrastructure and data protection. 24 7 automated customer support and artificial intelligence such as the skills that drive amazon alexa to process bias basic banking transactions it's important to mention that amazon is not afraid to fail traditionally amazon built core product pillars as amazon web services groceries first for itself and only after years of successfully building Amazon does launch it and expose a key product pillar to customers. In March last year, the consultancy Bain estimated that a banking service from Amazon could fuel to more than 70 million US customer accounts within five years, equalizing the size of the country's third largest bank, Wells Fargo. So, in general, not only Amazon, but tech firms has, have already reset customer expectations for what a good experience feels like. And as highlighted by Bain report, Amazon expected in entry into core banking heightens the urgency of accelerating work to improve the customer experience, largely by making it simpler and more digital. That's all from business model. Damien, over to you to recap. Okay, thanks, Javier. Some uh, really amazing business models there. And I, I guess uh, clearly um, picking out some of the facets of, of real disruption and innovation in there, it's uh, very, very helpful. So just to conclude then, I guess, before we go into uh, a Q&A, Paul's flashed a couple of questions at me that uh, we'll pick up but uh, we've seen fintechs are expanding and becoming more ambitious and we've posed a few questions in this session that I'm sure you're thinking about within your own businesses. Secondly I guess in such a competitive and scale market it's the point of relevance and how you address becoming relevant via a compelling strategy that remains key and finally how do you find a way to address the problems and drive those incremental returns that everybody's looking for. So to close, I'd reiterate my thanks for joining us today. I hope you've found the session useful. Uh, we are acutely aware, and um, I touched on at the beginning, that in an hour, some of the areas merit a much deeper discussion. 
and specifically how you apply these initial findings to start modifying and formula formulating your own strategic business plans is, is a deep dive subject and that will be subject to a follow on session, the details of which plus the slides you'll receive within the next uh, 24 hours and, and please feel free to uh, circulate the slides to your contacts should you feel, should you feel that relevant. Uh, our contact details are also on the slide pack and we are uh, delighted to hear from you directly um, and I'm just going to hand over to Paul now uh, as I say because I do understand there's a couple come through on the chat messaging so if I can refer over to you Paul to facilitate the Q&A yes. session. Thank you very much, Damien Javier. Wonderful program. I appreciate it. And I think there, I've, I've messaged over a question that's outstanding, but also maybe while you're thinking about that or if you want to address that one first, I'd also like to understand a little bit more in terms of, let's say, in Europe or in the UK, in terms of approaching financial institutions or banks or other players in the in the whole finance space, what is uh, what's what are some of the clever tips you might have? What's some inter interesting insights into how a partnership approach might be addressed? Obviously, these are huge institutions, and often it's hard to figure out you know where do you uh, where do you start? No, very good, very good point, Paul. And I, I guess uh, that could be the subject of a of another one hour webinar. And I, and <laughs> I know we don't have time, but I, I guess a few initial thoughts from me, um, starting with try and work out who your target market is. I, I try and work out who the banks are who, who have the problem that your potential solution fixes. I think you then need to start thinking about the scale of these opportunities, i.e. the size of the organizations, but also overlaying that a recognition and a, a sense of, um, if you like what I call the sales cycle, these are very large organizations and that will without doubt necessitate a very complex sales process. So I'd factor in quite long lead times and maybe think about rather than just going for the huge, uh, the huge guys at, at the start, also focus on a number of the smaller players so that you can get some traction, enable you to demonstrate value and also refine your proposition before any of the really large banks deploy. Uh, so that'd be a couple of things. I, I guess also in terms of how you target, certainly some of the companies that I've been working with, um, they've got a very strong advisory and, and uh, NED back, uh, background who, who help them refine the sales approach, but also as well, Personal introductions are, are really, really helpful, certainly in some of the larger organizations. So I'd work on your networks and try and find out the, I guess, the point of most least resistance. And again, the final point that I touched on in the presentation, understanding how the organization you're trying to sell into operates, how it's governed, who the key stakeholders in any process are. You know, you'll have compliance. It's not just the sales guys who want to use your product compliance, uh, credit risk maybe, they'll all be massively key stakeholders. So the quicker you can find out how the organization you're trying to sell into operates and you can build your plan around that, uh, the more likely you are to to get through uh, with, with, with some success. But as I say, hopefully a few tips in there that may be helpful, um, but certainly merits a, uh, a longer discussion because it's quite a complex topic. Great. I also have um, a question coming in on about, uh, I'll call it localization or geographical issues. Maybe this is more for Javier or for you, Damien, um, about developing a fintech pr proposition or proposal in one geographic or market uh, uh, proposition in one geographical area, then seeing if you can export that concept or technology or platform to another. How 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 powerful or how relevant is localization in geographical specificity to these types of market issues? I probably will take that one, Damien. I, I think, I mean, from my perspective, the first thing that I will say, considering the trends that we just saw in the FinTech uh, proposition, is that a, 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 a business model, a proposition, needs to have an international scope from day one. Because if you see, we're not longer talking about solving local problems. And that is the success that I can see from the most successful players out there. 
They have an international scope, which brings international investors' interest. And of course, also with that comes the highest amount of funding the, the, uh, globally. So I think that, that once a, there, there is a fintech proposition that is robust, the, it will depend uh, on how well you know your target market, how well you understand the local culture, and how effectively you can navigate regulation in that geographic territory. Uh, from my perspective, there are three elements that need to be considered when go uh, externally, going abroad. So first is to identify few priority geographies. So you, you should focus resources only on a small number of attractive markets where there is a natural fit or affinity or a strategic value. You can see, for example, UK banking, banking players uh, or digital players go first to the US rather than Europe, where it's a, a little bit more complex market, but the US can be bigger have a common language, a common regulation, and also similar culture than different to the, to the European one. The second one, I will say build networks and strategic partnerships. The focus on priority geographies should allow you to develop deep and ongoing connections with high quality local contacts. You don't necessarily need to go and stand alone by uh, building everything from scratch in completely new markets to actually grab its full potential. I think you can use key partnerships to scale up faster. And the third one, find the right team to handle the expansion. To be successful, you really need a strong teams that have a really intimate understanding of the local culture, your business identity, and also can evaluate the best way forward. The last thing that I will say is that you always need to be in mind that it doesn't matter how robust is your proposition or your business model, you should always be open to make the required variations or adjustments to it that best accommodate to the prospect market. So uh, I think that's, that's the key things to have in mind when thinking to go internationally. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Javier. Um, sorry, it's Damien here. So I, I've just um, I'm just picking up a question from the chat feed, and thank you for uh, whoever's put this on. But the the question is around Revolut and um, Revolut and Amazon, and can the business model of a player like Transferwise be compared to that started with international transfers and now launch an international debit card without fees? Um, okay, well, a, a, thank you for the question. I guess the, the answer is, is yes, because TransferWise are clearly picking up uh, scale and customers and data, all things that enable you to spin out, upsell. Uh, so they're doing that very well. Uh, I, I use that, the, the, their app myself as well. So they're continually iterating. They provide a a great customer experience. It, it's very efficient. It's uh, priced at a price point that the traction they are generating would would imply that um, it is is moving it forward. So I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't add more products. I don't know that business particularly well. Uh, Javier and I will probably do a little bit of research offline and and maybe give a more detailed answer but as a, as a general principle I think once you've built up as as you say uh, the question there around um, comparing it to Revolut once you've built up customer numbers data you provide a great experience and ultimately the consumer is then trusting in you and, and understands your brand then absolutely you can start to uh, add on additional products and services which will a tie them into you more, uh, which is great from a from a branding perspective. But separately, from a uh, commercial perspective, it's it's adding additional additional income lines. So uh, that would be uh, that would be my take on that. I don't know if uh, you wanted to add to that, Javier, at all. 
Yes, Damien, I think I think yeah, I think it's a it's a really good question. I think if we see a transfer wise business model has been very focused on exchange until now. They they have been uh, going to the US. It's one of the first fintechs to arrive to the US and start challenging there. And also is collaborating with fintech players. The, the, uh, with N26, uh, Monzo as well. And I think they have a, a very different uh, perspective from Revolut, but at the end, the opportunity is there. And, and, and I'm not surprised uh, as, as the move the uh, TransferWire has made in terms of, of having a additional uh, international uh, debit card move into another areas. And, and, and I think is 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 a good approach and and there is opportunity for for them to get a little bit more as as they are getting a lot of customers on board similarly to what revolut has done in the exchange uh, uh, trade exchange uh, application really so I, I think that will be my my add to that question it's not surprising that they they could end up uh, expanding to to for their services and products more than what they had done already in partners with uh, digital banks already. We are Starweaver, education you can bank on. For more information, contact us.